Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be talking about loops and spirals. My guest is James Tunney, author of many books, including The Mystical Accord, Sutras to Suit Our Times, Lines for Spiritual Evolution, The Mystery of the Trapped Light, Mystical Thoughts in the Dark Age of Scientism, Empire of Scientism, The Dispiriting Conspiracy and Inevitable Tyranny of Scientocracy, Tech Bondage, Slavery of the Human Spirit, Human Entrance to Transhumanism, Machine Merger and the End of Humanity, and most recently, Plantation of the Automatons. James lives in Gothenburg, Sweden, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, James. It's really fine to see you once again. Uh, great to see you as always, Jeff. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Well, we're going to dig a little more deeply into your book, Plantations of the Mind. It's, it's a very lengthy book. At the same time, it's both very scholarly and very poetic, which I think is uh, quite a balance to achieve. And, and you're dealing with foundational concepts like the concept of loop. It's uh, everywhere, as you point out, we, our lives are surrounded by thousands of loops. Uh, yes, Jeff. And in so in Plantation of the Automatons, I I developed this idea of the loop because I think we need to begin to think in different ways, in a lateral way, be, because of this over verticalization, if you like, of knowledge and the separation and uh, putting into silos of, of knowledge, that we have to think in a, in a different way, in in a more horizontal way, and in that context. The loop is important, not only for understanding the development of the automatic world, but for understanding our nature and consciousness itself. So it is already used in a range of disciplines, but I believe that it's critical. And people might think that this is overly metaphysical, but if you analyze the thinking process of people like George Soros or Elon Musk or the Chinese Communist Party, they they think in terms of these of, of loops and feedback loops and that's difficult for people to understand but when you begin to see the the pervasiveness of this concept and the ubiquity uh, not only in in practical context but information technology but in politics in governance in spirituality in consciousness in physics uh, you we will see that the idea is universal and if we begin to think in those terms, it may provide us a key to analyze better the world that we face and the challenges we face. Well, uh, first of all, let me apologize if I misspoke the name of your book, Plantation of the Automatons. Uh, uh, but also now, as a student of consciousness, I am not in the materialist camp. But if I were, I would be very involved in the concept of loops because it, it does seem as if uh, a materialist would say that consciousness itself must evolve out of feedback loops in the neurons. Yeah, well, this is a very interesting point that you put your finger on. And I know that your work, in a way, began as a process, as part of a general trend, I think, as a reaction against uh, uh, over-materialist behaviorism, or that's the context that I would put in, it in, that it's a, it's a broader, as, or it's an aspect of a broader dialogue and discourse um, within science. But if you look back to the people that led in cybernetics, if we take it from a, 
uh, an English perspective and we look at Ross Ashby and he, he began in the 40s to, to, to think very deeply about cybernetics and he was involved in the Ratio Club, the main centre, if you like, of thinking about cybernetics and he would have been involved in the war effort and he was interested in the, in the mind. And he uh, wrote a book called The Design of a Brain, uh, about, uh, which I think was published in 1951, 52. And in that book, he, he looks at cybernetics in relation to the mind. But early on in the book, he, ex he specifically excludes consciousness. He says this conversation is not, or this, this study is not about consciousness because consciousness may be fundamental and it's something that scientists can't, as of yet, uh, answer. So therefore, he left it out. Now, so, so that was interesting. So when he's talking about feedback loops he's talking about really what a lot of the uh, cyberneticians were interested in was how to predict and analyze human behavior and uh, or animal behavior as part of that left brain uh, con control mechanism and the idea of governance and so if we go on to more recent times we see that people like uh, Michu Kaku the, the the physicist he has seems to have come to an idea that consciousness is only feedback loops. So what has happened, and this is an argument uh, that I have argued uh, previously with you, that first uh, science began to cut out religion, then it cut out science or the spirit from, from scientific discourse. And, and now it's effectively cutting out consciousness because in this process, and you can see it in the work in some ways, of Douglas Hofstadter about uh, uh, strange loops, that there's a movement to take the idea of feedback loops beyond its original purpose, even within science and cyber, uh, cybernetics, and to argue that actually there's nothing there. There's no I, there's no self, there's, there's nothing. And to reduce it to feedback loops so that you can quantify or, or you can argue that a light bulb or a light system has, has a low degree of consciousness, for example. Now, this, for me, represents a perversion of, uh, of, of the scientific method uh, and also a, a, a really failure to understand what consciousness is. And uh, so we, in relation to the work that you do uh, uh, and in, in relation to the expansion or an expansive idea of, of consciousness, I think it's very, very important that we engage in in a dialogue with some of these uh, issues. But uh, the problem is not with the idea of feedback loops, it's the overly reductionist, materialist, uh, quantitative uh, focus of feedback loops that fails to see the wider context in which feedback loops operate. We have to also bring in biology, I think, Especially, you know, of course, the famous DNA molecule and, and the spiral, which you uh, suggest is also really a loop structure, ultimately. And, and that has to do with the very fundamentals of biological identity. Yes, there's no question that if we look at the, particularly the development of crystallography from uh, through the, the Braggs and then through uh, Bernal and then through uh, Crick and Watson, uh, you see that the application of X-rays towards crystals led to a, a particular answers and it led to particular solutions and it led to the revelation of the inner structure of some of the, the molecules uh, of living. And we, ha we have that chirality, that spirality uh, at, at the basis, which is with a, a, a kind of different aspect or a particular formation of, of, of a loop. So biology is uh, is very important in this context the evolution of biology is really in many ways we could look at it as a a study of the interaction of various loops and feedback mechanisms and and that also applies in relation to the uh, the brain as as far as i i can see it um but the the problem is that the mentality and it's often manifest in in the crystallographers is to come to a situation where everything is explained and everything is in, in, is defined in terms of structure and the container as opposed to the content. And this is the same problem that I would identify with a lot of the physicists when they're talking about consciousness. 
they ignore the container and they focus on the carrier or the, uh, 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 to explain uh, the system and they ignore the substance, uh, the essence itself that is being investigated or even uh, they lack consciousness of their own consciousness involvement as a participant uh, in, in this equation. So it's critical in all cybernetics that we live in, in a system of loops and the, the birth process, for example, operates, as far as I, I've read, uh, by a series of feedback loops that, that uh, causes a progression of, of stages to, to, to operate. So, so, so we know about that. But the problem is that there is a, an attempt to extrapolate from definite biological methods to a higher level of governance. Now, this is the key thing. We know that cybernetics means governance, and most of the people associated with cybernetics were in some way involved, either in the military-industrial complex or in efforts to say, well, how can we govern society better? And if you look at the work of Stafford Beer, for example, he took those, uh, those insights from biology and wanted to apply it to a system of governance, a total system of governance. And that's where you get the language of amplification of message from the government and attenuation of response back to it. And this is the language you can hear people like Elon Musk, if you listen intently, that, that's what they're talking about. Uh, and other ideas, for example, Soros talks about reflexivity, and that's a fundamental concept for him in the anal analysis of markets or financial alchemy, as he calls it, uh, how two different forces interact uh, to each other. So, I, 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 of course, these things are loops, but what we have to be careful about is the objective of study of some of these issues and why they're being studied and why there's so much investment. And when we come to a situation where your government is telling you that they're going to invest loads of money and finding out how to program your very cells like a programmable computer, well, I think that's the wrong direction. And it's certainly not the direction which the spiritual ideas of the uh, of the loop or of the spiral suggest, as, as people like Jill Purse wrote in a, in a nice book about the mystic spiral. Uh, or if we see in, in Sufism the, uh, the idea of the spiral and, and the movement and connection with the spiral in the transcendent sense. They're, they're two utterly different things. So it's the, uh, it's the reductive biological uh, determinism that, uh, that I think has been extrapolated from a left brain process and projected by the materialist method into a wider sense of governance, governance and a wider sense that, oh, well, we can govern people like that. And they are, after all, merely animals, uh, like other animals or machines that we can govern by governing the loops that they operate in. Well, it seems as if you're setting up a contrast between the, the power of the will, the power of the ego uh, of uh, individuals or perhaps institutions to control as opposed to a sort of mystical understanding of uh, surrender to a higher power. Well, yes, that's, that's a good way of putting it, Jeff. I think start, my, my, our conversation started off with, uh, from my interest and your interest in mysticism. So people then think that are forgotten about some of those and think that I'm only talking about dark things. I believe that the light forces and the dark forces exist. We can't just focus on either. They interact. They, in some ways, complement each other, in some ways, contrast. But we have to recognize uh, both of them. And we're at a crucial point in, in human history. We're, we're, the, the, we're at a crossroads. We, uh, we know all that. So uh, if we go back and, and think of it in spiritual terms, a lot uh, I have argued that a lot of mystical experience comes in the form of an intervention. It comes in this, uh, from a sensation, a feeling, a dream, a perception, and an experience of some sense of intervention into one's if you want normal loops, normal loops of thinking, because loops, of course, are very psychological. The, the way we behave, repeated behavior, and a loop is defined in many ways by a series of repetitions, particularly in computing context. So a lot of our lives are, are run in the automatic way as an automaton or following loops that we're comfortable with. And then suddenly an intervention happens that disturbs the viability or the idea that 
that loop is contained, that loop of behavior is contained. And often that enables us to expand to a higher loop, a higher loop of, in, of uh, information and interaction with a higher consciousness. And if we look back at the mystical poets of the 16th, 16th, 17th century, they talked sometimes of the, the circle of light. And the circle of light was an idea for them of connection with uh, God or whatever, whatever way you want to articulate that divine consciousness, the higher consciousness, that what, what you were doing was trying to expand so you had a circle to the highest force uh, and that that was the nature of the relationship of the individual to the source, if, if you like. So there's always a danger from a spiritual term when you put a, you, you circumscribe the extent of your your consciousness when you put a limit to it and i believe that those mystical interventions or or in the in the near death experience or even alexander etc the experience are showing us that there's often something outside the limitations of our cognitive coagulation of consciousness that we we, we fail to see what's beyond and so in some ways we're being dragged up or allowed to go to a, a different loop now the person or the mystic that's that believes that they're in touch in some sense or can appreciate or acknowledge that there is this force which is beyond completeness which can't be circumscribed by mathematics it can't be explained in the limited ways that we have it's ineffable it's it's going to be incomplete or our knowledge of it is going to be complete. It's the great mystery for indigenous people. Uh, by acknowledging that, well, then we will, not be, uh, we will not be contained by smaller loops and smaller loops, which in, in the course of history may turn out to be very mean ones, very, very, very limiting ones, not in our own interest and not in society's interest. So the the mystical journey in many senses is either breaking out of narrow loops or going on a spiral path or as you have used in in your uh, submission in in your great essay that picture from blake of the of the spiral ascent uh moving up jacob's ladder not just as a, a perpendicular series of steps up but a process of moving up and I, i've always believed that the spiral is is a, a a strong candidate for a fundamental symbol and when we're talking about spiral we have to uh, distinguish it in some ways from 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 a loop in that uh, not necessarily but but it, it suggests moving to a higher dimension that we can reach one access again but we see things or we can see things from a higher perspective and understand what went before although it seems to be uh, in in the same place so, uh, yes, there's a strong sense uh, of some of these ideas that, that pervade the mystical uh, literature and give us clues. And even in the biology, uh, as you've mentioned, the DNA is defined in terms of, of loops. But even if you, I was looking at the literature on LSD and how it behaves and it operates uh, and the brain, brain, and apparently the crystalline structure forms a kind of bond uh, in the brain with receptors that forms a loop that's, that's determined in, in, in its action. So even on the microscopic scale, we find it. And this is, this mirrors a little bit what, uh, Bernard Carr was talking about in his grand unified theory of linking the, the great, uh, science on a macro scale with a micro scale. And he uses the Ouroboros as, as, as a symbol of that. Now, I, I think the problem with that is, I agree with well, most of what he says, and he's he's one of the more enlightened ones because he understands about spirit and he's post-materialist. But I think that the uh, we have to not get into a situation where it's contained. Although we could argue that the circle is the uh, the other the sacred hoop for the native uh, native uh, Americans and native people represents the proper the, the proper another proper form. Since you brought up the image of the Ouroboros, the snake devouring its own tail, uh, it does remind me of an interview I did with 
my friend Jim Driscoll, who is a specialist in, in Renaissance literature. And, and we were talking about the problem of evil. And he suggested that that image of the Ouroboros is actually a, a, a symbol of evil because uh, the snake is so self-contained. It, it, uh, eating itself means it's, it's not allowing uh, any external influences uh, to come in. It, it becomes sort of self encapsulated and and that's a, a very dangerous place that's actually what my intuition would be as well my perception of it again it depends on the context but that's certainly a, a primary interpretation of its meaning for me it's the inability of of something or some force to understand that what it's attacking is of itself and that's what you always emphasize the mystical experience and oneness and that e emphasis and the failure to understand that the damage that we desire to inflict is really on ourselves. So uh, I, I think there's there's something in that. And uh, perhaps to, to, to just to finish or to clarify that as well, that when we think about the loop, it fits into a number of different possible bases in relation to motifs uh, in ancient art or in archetypal form. As it could be part of the, the thread doctrine, which is fundamental in, in, in all native traditions, the idea that the universe is woven, that everything is understood in, in terms of thread, and associated with that is the idea of knots and interlacing. Now, this is a crucial idea that underpins a, a lot of Indian art. It underpins um, uh, Mayan art as well, and it's informed as well, very close to the rhizome or the root or the stem system, the, the underground networks of plants. So they begin to have a, a, a correspondence, the thread and the links between the roots of plants. And that's manifest in all early art. It's manifest in the, the Book of Kells, for example. And there is an Ouroboros type figure in one of the pages in the Book of Kells, but it's a lot more complex. But in that context, it's demonstrating an interconnected form in a, in a more geomet geometric uh, way. Now, the Book of Kells and some of the pages were critically influential on James Joyce. They influenced his thinking. So when we come to uh, Finnegan's Wake and that, we have all this interleaving, interweaving of different languages, concepts, motifs, symbols uh, in, in, in a, a, a piece of work that refers back to that earlier tradition. And his idea, James Joyce's idea, or behind that, that, that Campbell took up of the monomyth, was, was heavily informed by that. So there's, there's, a, there's a direct, that's an example of a direct connection to some of these earlier theories. The problem I would identify is that these, these symbolic, metaphorical, artistic modalities, motifs, techniques, are now being taken in a left brain way and instantiated, materialized and turned into webs, nets, in order to control and confine the individual without any commitment to the higher values. And it's a mistaken idea of our interconnectedness. It's a mis and in fact, it will drive out values that, that exist. So, so, so it, it will seek to subsume the individual to exteriorize their consciousness and ultimately to take away their, their free will, in, in my view. So it's a mistaken direction if it's not informed by some uh, deeper sense. Now I'm reminded of uh, the Christian myth, the return of the prodigal son. It, it seems as if in, in this process of human evolution, it, it almost seems as if it's necessary that we try to push the, this idea that the ego can conquer all uh, because, for one thing, it does lead to progress, but for another thing, it often leads to the realization that there's something deeper than, than ego, the return of the prodigal son, so to speak. Yeah, I always, I always liked the, the, prodig the prodigal son. I, th I think there's a lot of uh, wis wisdom in that, and there is there is certainly an idea that exploration is necessary in order to understand. And so when you have your chats with Charles Upton, for example, 
uh, he, he hasn't been living under a rock. He can draw on the experience of, of, of having lived in, in a vibrant culture in order, therefore, uh, it gives authenticity to his work. So when he's saying that he respects the, the traditional uh, approach and the traditionalist approach, it has more currency in many senses because of, I'm not saying he's a prodigal son, but in the context of having had some comparators and, and it, it creates that contrast. And the, the period we're going through is creating that contrast where the value of light will, will become evident. So that's why I, I also think that it's very important for any, and I'd call them spiritual advocates, people that are advocating for spiritual consciousness. I think it's very, very important that they don't close the door on the prodigal son, that they, they don't do it out of their wisdom or that they don't act like the first son in that context. And, and in that sense, we have to be open to people who we believe in some sense are part of this apparatus of control or involved in these things. We can't make presumptions about that. My argument is that we should seek to persuade them and advocate for our point of view and ask and put the questions and put the uh, discussion on the table uh, in a way that doesn't seek to do the damage that we claim that we want to avoid. So that's, uh, in, in many senses, I, I don't see the, the people uh, that uh, that are leading these things as uh, as my enemies in that sense. I, I see the po certain policies as misguided. Uh, same as we talked about in relation to the environment. There's more examples coming out about the Congo and cobalt and modern slavery again in the Congo with all they've suffered over the uh, the, the last hundred years and more, going back to the um, Ro Roger Caseman and that. That's that again it suggests mistaken loops about the direction that we're going in and that we have to look at the consequence of our actions. And also that sometimes we think we're doing good, but the loop that we're involved in is not necessarily beneficial. There may be another loop that we, sh we should be involved in. So, and the last point, uh, Jeffrey, uh, if you look at the development of automation, we have this idea of in the loop. So the more in the loop you are, the more control you have over a system. So the what Jack Alul said was that the nature of the technological society with technique is it drives out the organic. So that means that will drive out the human. So you won't be in the loop. You won't be in the loop driving your car. The car is going to be driven for you uh, in a system which allows it to be driven uh, as much as the system uh, wants you to. But when you move when you move out of that loop of control of your, your vehicle or whatever, you move into a different loop of control. So we're always moving from one loop to another loop. I say be careful about moving into the loops of an electronic straitjacket that we won't be able to recover from, which seeks to uh, to control our daily behavior, uh, often on a low level. There's loads of uh, satellites being shot up in the, in, as we speak. In, into a space to control us uh, and uh, that uh, it's not a, it's not the direction that we want to go in Jeff in my view I recall years ago the book uh, Megatrends by uh, John Nesbitt in uh, he he was an interesting fellow he seemed to be very close to uh, right wing conservative uh, politics and and the high tech world of, of uh, the San Francisco Bay Area and he talked about a a concept. Uh, he called high tech, high touch. And for myself, that seemed like a very important concept growing up in, uh, or coming of age, really not growing up in the uh, Silicon Valley area, the San Francisco Bay area, where so much computer innovation was taking place. It seemed as if the, the very people who were at the forefront of uh, the computer world were also in the forefront of trying to integrate uh, an understanding of mysticism into their work. That argument is certainly made and you have the ideas of technosis and you also have a very strong sense uh, from the 60s onwards that a lot of the technological people, uh, the, the technological wizards, were libertarians. And this, this is a, a standard trope argument motif 
typology associated with with uh, Silicon Valley that they were liberating us in some way. Now, uh, I don't necessarily see it that way. They may have had those values. A lot of people believe that technology frees us. It does in some ways. It gives us some freedoms uh, to do things that we, we, we can't have accomplished. But ultimately, one always has to be subsumed or will always be subsumed in the bigger loop. And that's what Mumford was talking about in the mega machine. It's the totality of the system within which this system operates. Perhaps, for example, uh, Friedrich Kittler in Germany was a media theorist, and he, in the context of discussions about the growth of automatic music, he said, or he challenged the artist and said, well, most of the recording equipment that you use or that you use in Germany came from the government who it, when it was oppressing us. So recording equipment and the music industry, in, in many senses, go together. Most electronic music, most computer music, really came out of the military industrial complex from, from Bletchley Park, etc. Now, and, and from that, uh, I, I, I was looking at areas like synth pop and, and, and the music of the 70s and the 80s, and there's some interesting things there. There's often a lot of tragedy associated with some of the great artists that, that were there um, and in some sense it's another example for me of what you talk what you mentioned last time we talked the canary in the coal mine that people understand the possibilities of the technology they use them they artistically find some great solutions and i wonder whether there's a deeper existential despair that creeps in when they understand where the totality of the system might go because often even in pop music if you go back and look at some of the statements like Kate Bush, for example, and some of the some of the statements she makes about being alone with her computer and they're really prescient in relation to how our life is today. I would have kind of when I heard them originally just not paid attention to them. But there were some people that were acting as canaries in the, in the coal mine saying, OK, this is the technology. This is the context. But uh, there's a danger to it. And also, if you look at the work of say Brian Eno who worked with Roxy Music and with U2 and uh, developing the concept of ambient music if, if, and music that works through loops and is kind of self-perpetuating and self-composing to a certain extent. Well, uh, the ambient music, you say, what do you mean by ambient? Now for me, ambient music m refers to this emerging technosphere that we're going to live in. That it is the sound. It is the sound of the world that we're, we're going to move into. So I, I don't see it in a necessarily uh, positive way. Of course, there's a lot of interest and developments. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a piece of music called Disintegration Loops, which was finished on September 11 by an artist in New York. I think his name is Bezinski. That's quite interesting. It wouldn't be everyone's cup of tea. Playing a loop in the sense of repeated music, uh, repeated sound as Laurie Anderson, uh, for example, developed very popularly. And it's a kind of disintegration. It's a loop that disintegrates and it produces some strange effects which sound like, uh, like, like something living. Uh, so there are interesting reflections that one can uh, come to. But unfortunately, we're talking about the, uh, the, the future of human consciousness being integrated into this a mechanical environment. So it's the mechanization and the utilization of systems and even the propaganda. The propaganda now operates by a loop in computer terms. It sends out a message until it gets its result through different, to different structures. It's very, very difficult to avoid. And then we get dragged into that loop of propaganda. We get dragged unconsciously, consciously into a loop where we end up repeating, uh, repeating things we have been programmed with. And uh, it's no surprise that the next step is merely to directly insert the things in our bodies. Well, you brought up Charles Upton. I've really enjoyed interviewing him. I think uh, I just completed uh, our ninth interview. And uh, I realized that he believes, based on the metaphysics of René Guénon, that we're in a dark age. 
and uh, it's going to get darker. And he sees that as pretty much inevitable. It's going to get darker and darker until at some point, I think he does see that, you know, a after all the demons have been unleashed on us, there, then there will be uh, an influx of angelic light. Uh, again, I believe that's his eschatology. But uh, how do you see that? It, it it seems as if you're suggesting that we should we shouldn't succumb to this dark age that seems inevitable. That we should be in in some way struggling against it or minimally speaking, at least conscious of it. I actually I, I was given a present by one of your viewers of of Charles Upton's book Legends of the End. I think it's called recently. So I did read uh, read some of his views, and I find his uh, views very consistent with uh, my own understanding of the perennial philosophy. Uh, only I, I would have a slight difference of emphasis. Um, I don't agree with the determinism of some of the perspectives in relation to apocalypse. I don't, I don't think that's what the implication is. And I, 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 I fear sometimes if we believe that the game is up and there's no point uh, in, in struggling in, in that context. So I would have a slight different emphasis. I mean, you have, I listened to the the talk on angels recently uh, on, on You Thinking Aloud uh, with the lovely woman from, from Dublin. I've listened to, to, to a lot of uh, her work and she emphasizes the light all the time and, and she's, she seems to be very strong and not emphasizing darkness. But uh, and then uh, Charles Upton properly, I think, would put darkness into the picture. So we have to recognize both. We have to recognize these dangers, these warnings, these concerns. But sometimes I think the uh, the idea of a particular time uh, and a particular dark period uh, refers to something which is beyond time it refers to our state of evolution on the spiral which is beyond time so that we, we we have to be a little bit careful in my view just to qualify that we don't we don't understand or, or that we, we 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 believe therefore that we should succumb to those forces or it's inevitable or there's nothing you can do because that can add to a different type of hopelessness my belief is that and starting off from the mystical accord that there's been a failure of spiritual evolution and the solution is to evolve consciously that, that that's what we have to do and it's to break through to the next level it's to move on to the next level which 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 is suggested by all the great teachers which has to be about the imagination the imaginal world we have to break out of the chrysalis of of our limiting consciousness to refer back to the use of imaginal that frederick myers uh, started so that that's what the what the crucial thing is uh, there is you you did talk also about time loops uh, with mr wargo i think uh, before um yes. and and uh, i think there's there's a slight there's a slight difference in emphasis uh, perhaps I'll, I'll use this example there's an idea you, you can get into an idea i'm not saying this about charles upton but you can't get an, into an idea that history is just circular and repeating itself in different phases and that's in particular for uh, associate with pe pe people like Vico uh, and uh, Nietzsche and James Joyce used it, but he used it in an interesting way. He turned it into a technique. So, for example, in Finnegan's Wake, when you're reading the start, River Run Past, Even Adams by from Ben the Bades' Swerve of Shore, and then you go to the end and you find you're still with the river, and all the other things have happened in the night. But the river is coming, the river Liffey and Olivia Plurabella is coming into the sea. And as the river is coming into the sea, you're in the consciousness of the river as it's going into the sea. And of course, a river going into the sea is changing from fresh water to seawater. So it's changing its being, it's dying. So she's dying. So she's feeling like she's dying. She's moving to a different level of, of being. She's going back in some ways to her father that has she's been thinking about her mad cold and fiery father she's moving in she's hearing the sounds of the seagulls of the leaves on the uh, on the water as she moves in and of course we know that as the as the 
river is moving in and she's moving through history. She's moving through where the Vikings came in, where the Normans came into this place, where all the different layers through history have come in cycles as they endlessly will into any place, in any particular place. She's moving into that and she's dying. But we know that she's being reborn. She's going into the sea, but through the precipitation cycle, of course, so there'll be evaporation and there'll be some another aspect of Anna Livia Plurabella coming, hitting the mountains from the clouds and coming back in that form as well. So there's a circularity about it. Uh, whether it's the exact same circularity, the exact same repetition uh, is, is another issue. He also uses it in the dead. He uses the te technique and it's a technique that goes back to Homer and that when in the short story of the dead, which was also made into a film, he's in the, the main character has had an experience his wife has been uh, that it was the feast of the epiphany uh, on january the 6th and a memory was sprung by a song that she heard when she was coming when she was leaving and she was upset about a lost lover and uh, he was kind of moved by the depth of her emotion that she had bottled up inside her and she falls asleep and he looks out the window and he sees the snow falling and he looks up and he sees the snow flakes coming over Dublin and he's thinking that the newspapers were right and snow is general all over Ireland and it's falling on the dark central plain and the, on the mutinous waves of the Shannon and it's falling in the west of Ireland and on the cross and the graveyard the crooked crosses of the man that lay buried who died because he loved his wife once upon a time Michael Fury was his name and in that process what we see is that the con the person is contained in their own emotion, their limitations, their way of viewing. And by looking up at the at the snowflakes coming down, they remind them of all the living of the dead and the snowflakes in the way descending represent the human spirit that uh, that will fade away as well and will melt. But it has a presence uh, in, in some sense. And he is looping into to eternity into the interlinkage uh, of people into the interlinkage of emotions of life of, of meaning uh, etc so uh, to finish the, the question i think there's a the, we are going through a very very dark time uh, but i would emphasize the extent to which we have created that time that it's in our hands that that it, it, it's it's the game is in play that we have bet on the wrong horses emphasized the wrong things, being too narrow-minded, made serious mistakes that we can correct, uh, we can have a, a different approach, uh, and that the darkness is, for me, it's, it's on a spiritual level and it has to be corrected. And certainly there are angelic beings and there are demonic beings, and that we, uh, well, I want to align with the angelic ones at least, and be aware of, of, of what these things are or mean, And but I, I'm very, very hopeful uh, there will be, uh, I've, I've, I've said, uh, and, and in fact been defined in many senses by my identification of the darkness, but that's because I think the contrast with the light will become more pronounced, and I'm, I'm positive in the, in the long run. Whoa, what a brilliant exposition that was. I, I am so touched, and, and I am so delighted that you've invoked uh, the spirit of James Joyce, because as I've read through your book yet again, the plantation of the automatons, I'm uh, trying to struggle with how you managed to uh, integrate scholarship and poetry. And, and it dawned on me that Joyce was a big inspiration for you in bringing these worlds together. Yes, he, I mean, he was very important for me at a, at a particular stage. And then I began to think that I wasn't sure about what Joyce was saying in relation to uh, spirituality. And then I'm beginning to see uh, on a different level again that some of the things, what he was saying, it wasn't, it's certainly not clear. It's certainly not easy accessible, uh, but he's, he, he's articulating a very uh, profound view, uh, a profound view of what lived life is, is like and that we have to uh, understand the cosmos in terms of the normality, the ordinariness of life, and that is it, it is in the conduct of of life that we uh, we must look at. But in that is a very deep and rich sense of the interaction between the uh, the, the various forces, and and 
uh, on the spiral of meaning again I go uh, I go back to him and he of course was really set on his way by A.E. Russell. A.E. Russell was one that helped him on his way at right at the start uh, and Joyce was very aware of the currents of of mysticism of um, of the Irish revival of magic of what was going on with uh, in, in those spheres and he didn't the nature of and the construct of his mind wasn't such that he would be taken by by those things but he did seek to do through a very sometimes left brain approach to to, to bring it to a to, to force that left brain approach to a different a different level onto a different level which leaves a lot of in Finnegan's Wake for example I believe there's a lot of anticipations of, of, of the of the future quark and things like that came from the idea came from or the word came from uh, Finnegan's Wake and there are still things in that that anticipate and again that w he would reinforce probably actually that cyclical view he would probably adhere to the idea that there is a cyclical time view more so than than, than I would but I think he shows us a way that we can use it you use the idea of escaping from the containment of our own limited view to a broader view and I think that's what we we have to do and that's part of the contextualization of our evolution that's part of the idea we have to be pragmatic and be cosmopolitan we we have to to, to, to be both uh, in in the future and look to some of these that's what artists are for the the the, the good ones they give us a clue uh, pointers and we may not see what they're talking about we may reject them uh, but we can we can move on and 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 find things when we need them i, I know i'm jumping around a bit. that's great i like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems as if uh, that that's what loops do they they jump around but i'll bring you back uh, again to a, a recurring theme and one of the recurring themes in our discussion is about control and and about how various I guess you would have to say elites in our culture. I don't like that term, but I hear it all the time. Uh, the elites, the Elon Musks, the George Soros's, the perhaps the Catholic Church or the United States government or the, the other big governments are going to use uh, these loops to to control and and. It, I recall a discussion I had with Charles Upton about this in which I suggested that these are really competing interests. That's a, a pluralistic uh, group of elites, if, if, if you will. They don't all see things the, the same way and that ultimately uh, because uh, there are all of these pluralistic organizations, there's lots of room for human freedom in, in there. We don't have to become dominated by any, any one of them. Uh, and then he brought up this subtle argument that there is a dark spiritual force behind all of them, and they may seem to be diverse, but ultimately they are all expressions of the same satanic influence that's ruling the world. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Oh, I do indeed, Jeffrey. Now, now let me say, if I was uh, Jewish uh, and I heard talks about elites, and and uh, I, I I would be uh, very very cautious because often this is used for genuine classic anti-Semitism, and unfortunately, as a non-Jewish person, uh, I can objectively, as far as I can see, identify very recently, that we have a return of classic anti-Semitism. So, and that classic anti-Semitism is identified with the success of, of, of Jewish people who have achieved great things in their various fields and is used, as has always been used by empires, to point a finger and distract when they want to point uh, attention away from genuine forces. It was used in Britain. It was has always been used in Britain. It's certainly been used in Russia. So th th there are. Uh, I, I can understand uh, why we have to be careful about elites. But so that's why. So so let me answer slightly different to to reinforce. Actually, I agree with what he says basically. But uh, there's different ways of articulating. I would look to. The language of the people who are controlling us themselves, and that, that then I would look to 
the studies of people like Donella Meadows, for example. So she was advising, for example, the uh, the 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 Club of Rome and the Club of Rome <laughs> and uh, the various bodies uh, from her for a knowledge of of cybernetics. And she said the the most important thing is the end when you can have all the other d details, feedback loops and systems, propaganda, the whole lot, policies, parliaments, the whole lot. But the most important thing is the ultimate aim. So you can look at the global the 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 global context and say, well, actually, there's all these competing interests. Unfortunately, there's not. This is what my argument is. My argument is that we're facing the rise of globalism through imperial scientism. It's a very specific specific argument based on a historic analysis of the, the power of Atlanticism, sea power in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, developed into telecommunications. So I'm arguing that there is this ultimate aim and that that can tolerate a whole range of apparently diverse forces, which are not diverse forces. So when you get to BlackRock, etc., and organization, investment companies, they steer all these and they even steer the opposition. So there's an awful lot of faux left politics, for example. It's not any any left politics that I recognize. My grandfather would have been more socialist, for example, he was a member of parliament, uh, although he was Catholic, but, but, but that was, was his interest in the people, etc. His, his son was a politician as well, he, he, but he was more conservative. And, and, and the, they, they, they could be reconciled, there was possibilities. But I don't recognize, or if you look back 1916, one of the great leaders that was shot in, in his chair in 1916 was James Connolly, who was, a, who was a, a strong kind of Marxist socialist and very, very important thinker. Um, but uh, they now, there's not a lot of correspondence between uh, certain political views and what these people were talking about, because the capitalist system, the corporate system, can control both sides. Now, the Chinese Communist Party and the Western capitalist system are both corporatist. And I believe that they can come together eventually, whatever remains after the various shenanigans go on, they will be able to come together in a technocratic management of a technocratic society. So the, the crucial, so, so you can have that aim. And if you look at antitrust law, the, the nature of competition law, which I used to think about and write at the highest international level, it's based on preventing this coming together of forces, preventing cartels, preventing a company attaining a dominant position. Because once you do that, well, then the company in a dominant position or the cartel can act in a way that they couldn't do in a competitive market and get supranormal profits and they can reduce technological development and there's no choice. So they become independent, whereas the customer becomes dependent and the consumer becomes dependent to such an extent that the nature of their independence uh, defines what they do and they can ultimately act independently of their consumers and customers and they don't have to listen to complaints or think that they are a gift <laughs> like uh, like we should do as, as we heard recently so this is the nature this is a structural issue which is defined and has been studied in economic terms and political terms we throw into that ideas of uh, Peter Dale Scott about the deep state, for example, that can, or the military industrial complex as well, that can grow and, and they can have their own interests, their own loop of interests, which are beyond uh, political power. And this was what Tolkien was talking about. Now, I know there's a lot of debate about whether Tolkien was talking in terms of allegory or not, but he defined it in terms of the ring. So the ring symbolizes power. So the ring is. Uh, an ultimate symbol of power. It's the symbol of power coming together to control things. Uh, power, because ultimately, when we're talking about a board or board of directors, or whatever, we're talking about a ring of people in, in, in some sense that can make decisions. Uh, so Tolkien believed that the machine world that we were we were entering was associated with this ring power and his. His complementary partner in that context, C.S. Lewis, saw the movement towards a scientocracy. 
and he talked about the inner ring and he, and, and he believed that this was everywhere. He believed that 90% of people were drawn into these inner rings that in all societies and all networks beyond the top that you are drawn into a process, a social process that you align yourself to that becomes more powerful than you and it becomes determinative of, of, of where you go. So there is a process whereby, and I, I, belie I believe the Catholic Church has aligned itself with this globalist, it's inherently globalist itself. So certainly there is an argument that they have aligned themselves with this global corporatist force, unfortunately, uh, because and they were a, a body that was played for in, in, in this context. So I do believe, I, I do, I, I share that. I, I do believe that uh, all the evidence, and I tried to identify the evidence, points to the evolution of a technocratic corporate uh, set of interests that coalesce around the control of a mass system of technology which can control the population by the establishment of an automatic system of governance that replaces democratic systems that can ally communist and capitalist and will eradicate uh, the, uh, humanity as we know it uh, and I don't have any doubt that a lot of those people believe it's the optimum solution or the best solution or that there's not sound justifications or they, they have a certain view of climate change, for example, that lead, leads to that. But uh, I, I personally believe that uh, I agree with that. It's a dark force. So when you come to the state, is it satanic? Is it what I, I, I've, I've used the term satanic, Promethean, Luciferian, a range of different ideas which indicate that you believe that the materialist world is the only one that exists. It's an ultra-materialist perspective and that it's characterized by a Promethean desire for fire, that the control by firepower is a, an associated power, whether it's the atom, atom bomb, warfare, whatever, is some kind of, of link, that it's, it, it's the triumph of the will in the pursuit of the new man and new woman, the superhuman that Aurobindo warned us about, that Aurobindo criticized Nietzsche about, so he criticized from a spiritual perspective. So what we're talking about is the triumph of the will uh, as manifest in the sorcerer, as manifest in scientism, as manifest in the technology of war used to control humanity. Because what, last idea, if you look at the language of cybernetics, you have a regulator and causes of disturbance. That's, this is often the way they describe it. So unfortunately, free will is a cause of disturbance and it has to be regulated, it has to be crystallized. So I, I agree with him. Uh, I tend to avoid uh, uh, too much articulating in terms of Satanism, etc., uh, although I agree with that, because uh, I think there's a using Occam's razor, there's a simpler explanation which can be based on history and it can avoid drifting in to simple analysis which labels, I'm not saying from his, his is a very sophisticated analysis, but for other people they can pick up particular elements without doing the, the, the hard work underneath to find, you know, that keeps the duck floating, you know, furiously on the water. I think that's a very coherent analysis uh, I also know that you, you've you raised the issue of fear, that that people are being frightened by by various boogeymen uh, to, into conforming with, with this Im impending mechanical worldview. I'm certainly no advocate of a mechanical worldview, but there are things that frighten me. Uh, I, I think legitimately so. We've talked about, for example, uh, issues of pollution, issues of uh, nuclear proliferation and nuclear waste disposal. And it does seem to me that uh, also economic issues of disparity between the, the rich and the poor, that uh, the idea of some sense of global unity in order to address these issues uh, does seem to me to be uh, a, a good, not only a good solution, but probably a necessary solution. Yeah, but I'm sure Adolf Hitler used harmony as uh, often when he was talking about the benefits that would be there during in the, the Third Reich. I'm sure Stalin used harmony and the need for everyone can melt out these things and they can they can 
talk the talk and and they but but by their fruits shall you know them and by what they do so if the people that are ruling you are utilizing uh, techniques which are not consistent with human dignity now well then you can be certain that on a bigger scale uh, th there'll be less of them because it's accept accepted that democracy can't work in the same way on, on on a larger scale so we can't we can't expect more of that and also uh, to a large extent and i've seen it in my lifetime and i've seen it very close up jeff from talking to some of these people that knew a lot what was happening the political system has changed in the last generation it's been more influenced by corporatism by control of political party structures and it's very very difficult to recover that uh, it's going to be very very difficult to recover that we're facing a corporatist system who will be in control which have their own interests which see things in a very very narrow form which see things in uh, on a balanced book kind of way divorced now of any ethical uh, constraints because the movement of scientism is to abolish any idea not just of morality or ethics but even that you exist as a human or that humans are, uh, should exist or that the self exists or that the person exists and when they do so they are eliminating uh, they are eliminating restraints on on power every growth of legal rights was associated with a struggle by one group to control the powers above it, whether Magna Carta, for example, from the barons to control the king in their movement towards tyranny. There is a natural tendency to power from certain people. Certain people love power. Certain people want power. Certain people can get power that was hitherto undreamed of in, in the way the world has evolved. And this, this is a great danger. So uh, we will have all the fear in, in, in the present corporatist model it will be fear daily until you transform that's not, not not going to be solved by these issues it's quite clear that ultimately in the solution of these issues in the in the peacemaking process for example it's really associated with a change in consciousness so people that laid down their arms in northern ireland they did so because from a change of consciousness that is a slow is a slow process and a, a, a not spectacular process so ultimately without a change in spiritual evolution all of these things will happen the there will be a greater proliferation of uh, nuclear dangers of nanotechnology in the environment of pollution in the environment but uh, if we begin to commit to spiritual evolution in out of recognize our identity as common on the spiritual level that irrespective of any religion, any any existing position, any other identity, that we're if we recognise that we're spiritual beings, we're in a better place to find our commonality. And then there are certain principles that if we're if we're committed to reducing the military industrial complex, if we're if we're produced to stop pollution first of all, and 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 before a, making solutions to problems that turn out to be counterproductive if we adopt a prophylactic approach which is always what i've argued for in certain policies a cautious approach in relation to what we release into the environment over what we investigate is it a good is it really good to unearth mammoths and labs and and find out what viruses they have and release them into the environment is it really good to be investigating a lot of these dangerous viruses and making them making them worse in the lab is is that really consistent with a sensible prevented uh, approach and to use another tread uh, proverb a stitch in time saves nine etc so so we could there's a lot of wisdom in in common parlance that that helps us on on those issues the idea that there will be a solution through the force of the forces that are there the co the existing forces that are the cause of the pollution that are the cause of the uh, of the instability that are the cause of the war is just not wrong so it's going to be a, a devastating negative global governance system if we don't have a true uh true really through the heart of people uh, and i don't mean that just come together and sing kumbaya and sit around and and you know uh, take drugs and and sing nice songs. I, I don't mean that it has to be in a very disciplined way it has to be in a disciplined way and a real way which is respectful and also aware of existing traditions and existing 
discord existing uh, an, uh, existing possibility. So it requires a great imagination, but that can only come from believing in the power of our imagination and, and our consciousness, which is another lesson of the of spiritual consciousness. But if you start off and you say, well, actually, Jeff Mishlov is really only a set of feedback loops and nothing more. It's kind of difficult to really bring it up to to a higher level. If I'm not willing to recognize your humanity and recognize your humanity as a manifestation of the divine force or the larger force, if you don't want to say the divine thing, but it's difficult to proceed from there. And and I believe in that. I believe that that that, that you are the, the the fractal of the of the divine, and I believe that in your exploration. You're, 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 you're exploring that movement out of existing loops into different loops and that that's the nature of progress. That's the nature of the, of the, the spiral evolution that the people in ancient times understood about, which is why they, they recognized uh, and, and used that uh, archetypal force. But we have to be very, very careful about that uh, hyper-materialism, uh, hyper-consumerist uh, forces which will now change. They're, they're, they're going to change. They're, they're going to change and say, "Well, actually, there's been too much consumer, so you're not getting what you used to do, and you can stay at home, and you're not going to move around. So your freedoms are going to be lost in accordance with this supposed um, uh, free market. It's not a free market system. It, uh, so, and the corporatists are not interested in freedoms for individuals. They're interested uh, in control, and that is the dominant, dominant modus, which is. Is, is there in really all the plans, all the documents, if you look at it in, 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 a, in a scholarly way. It's not some intuition of bad people. It's a, it's a reality, a consequence of a crystallizing mindset that intends to crystallize human consciousness itself. Well, Charles Upton, who we've been speaking about quite a bit in our conversation today, would say that if if we're going to adopt a spiritual approach, a disciplined spiritual approach, we need to do it in alignment with the great religious traditions, with the perennial philosophy. Uh, we can't be dilettantes about it. We can't pick and choose from the spiritual supermarket. We need to find, you know, he, he has become a Muslim Sufi, for ex example. How do you feel about that? I've listened to his conversations, uh, to your conversations with him and about that. And my disposition is generally towards that in, in one sense and against it in another sense. And, and this is a, an area of debate I have with a lot of people that I'm sympathetic to on other issues. And it, it is an issue associated with New Ageism. That when I when I talk to certain of my associates, friends, uh, communicants in the context of uh, people that are exploring different spiritualities, there's often a very strong movement against dogma, and dogma is bad. Dogma, is, you know, any rules, any creeds, any, uh, and it becomes a kind of parody, and it becomes a kind of nonsense at the end when you keep saying, "Well, what is it you actually believe in?" You know, and what is what does that mean? for a principle in relation to how we conduct our life. And I, I, I don't really get the answer in, in my head or when I look at our work and that. And uh, there is a great danger that people want the appearance of reality without the boredom of reality, as Francis Bacon, uh, the painter, would have said. They, they, they want the appearance of, they want a simulacrum. And uh, so this is a great problem. One can't ignore the basic principles that underlie the great traditions. And certainly, I think he's right in relation to the tradition is very, very important. So I, for example, would be more drawn towards the, the, the Tridentine Mass, the Latin Mass, the Pre-Vatican II uh, Mass, although all of those people are being alienated by the, the church is moving against that, moving against, uh, which is another debate. But So I, I'm, I'm more sympathetic. I, I think there's more richness and more truth in, in that and more continuity and, and something to be gleaned from that. But, and here is the but, that all of the religions have failed in relation to the problems I'd identify. And not only have they failed, but they're part of the process. So I can't see from the what I, I, I have been looking at that Catholicism, Protestantism, Islam or Judaism have sufficiently addressed these problems. 
they have failed. They have failed. The Catholic Church has failed miserably. Now, it could have, if you look at the work of John Paul II, for example, his work on personhood was very, very important. Although if you, look, if you, if you read Malachi Martin's analysis, he believed that um, John Paul made mistakes in relation to his involvement in geopolitical evolution. John Paul II, from the time 19, in the 70s, explained that Christianity was coming to an end uh, uh, as we know it and that there would be a new world order. He was one of the ones that identified this force and uh, he was very aware of it. But whether he his involvement achieved the geopolitical results is another question. The institution itself is not addressing these issues. In the tradition, all the richnesses are there about the dignity of the human, about, in fact, how you can have socially cooperative uh, interactions. If you look back, the biggest cooperative uh, in the world, in, 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 in the Basque country, I think was set up by a, pri a priest, but it was certainly informed by Catholic teaching. You can do things in different ways, uh, but uh, it is inherently a globalist organization, and it seems to be aligning itself w with those four. So it has failed, in my view. In relation to Protestantism, you can go back and you can find great, uh, pastors, great leaders, Martin Luther King, for example, who may have been uh, able to, or a figure like him, may have been able to uh, play an important part. Uh, but where are they? Uh, and in Judaism, there, are, there are, are some figures, but are they really addressing, are they applying the religious tradition to a contemporary context? I, I don't think, I think they've all failed. I think the whole lot of them. So what that suggests to me is, that insofar as the argument is that all these, all these religions come from a similar perennial root, that they all have a same root. And also I would include uh, Native American theology as well, and, and the great spirit, the great mystery, Watantanka, whatever you want to call it, that there has, an, uh, there's always been a conception of a divine source. We have lost some elements. We have lost the feminine aspect. We have lost this concern for the earth that, that was driven out at certain stages in a number of, of the different religious traditions. So if you say you're a perennialist and that that root was the same, uh, well, where is the where are the branches going? If they're all going in different directions, it's not really ultimately useful to the addressing of contemporary affairs. So what I argue is now, Although you come from a particular tradition, in relation to the analysis of the mundane and how it operates, you can't stay within your box and, and usefully contribute towards the spiritual evolution or you can become part of the problem. And even when you look at analysis, say, in Islam, uh, there are problems in relation to how Islam, because is Islam is decentralized, that gives it a great benefit, but it can, it, you can have various forms of Islam that don't that, that share major differences, and there's a difference between Wahhabism and Sufism. We have to, and they would deny some of them would deny that Sufism is, is part of Islam. There's all these debates going on. What is the where is the breakthrough? The breakthrough point. I believe that the solution and spiritual evolution will be very linked to the tradition, but it will be at a different level. It will be moving up a level of spiral which will be able to include the people who come from an atheist background, who come from different things, who can't fit into those traditions, who can't take all the dogma. But at base in all the traditions is an idea that we're spiritual beings, that the spiritual beings that we are, are beings that will persist after this incarnation, that we're related to a greater force, and that we're meant, we're meant to evolve. And in this mortal and mundane uh, context that we are meant to recognize the divinity in other people and from that treat them with respect with the respect that we would treat ourselves and i would add to that treat nature animals water the earth uh, in a respectful way because this is our universal home so I would I would challenge him and say I think there has been failed. Show me please where the the major Sufis are that are telling us the problem. They're identifying in a very specific way 
the uh, in, in a, a forensic way the problems and the solutions to these global problems because otherwise the spiritual tradition is a mere is a mere and I don't say this about him I have a great respect for him but other for a lot of people it can be a mere recreation something a mere social activity something that has the appearance of deep spirituality but doesn't really I, I had a, had a, a vision uh, a, a year or two ago uh, just to, just to finish off on that and it was a vision of of uh, I, I don't call it a deep vision. I would, I would classify it as a whole range, of, but it's just an image, if you like, of um, Christ outside the window. And he was telling me that he'd left the building. And I've related that before in the sense of like Elvis has left the building. That spirituality, and that for me meant that spirituality has to be translated into functional terms that can operate the complex society which subjected uh, technological some technological control which has become cosmopolitan and which was which must unify and speak to different traditions informed by our knowledge of what has happened and not simplified into something which cannot identify some fundamental principle so i have a, I have a lot of respect for that view but i think it's i, I think there's a danger that it can become a, a refuge, uh, and I, I can see this with young people as well, for people that want a totalizing structure that can get them through uh, life uh, without being able to solve the problems. And I think that spiritual consciousness was meant to be active. It doesn't have to be uh, drawn into certain short-term issues, but in a deeper sense, we have to find our, our connection with other people. Beautifully put. I, uh, I can hardly disagree with you. Uh, on the other hand, I know there's a lot more to be said about it. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation, James. I'm, I'm just delighted to have this time with you. Do you have any final thoughts before we conclude our program today? I do, yeah. Actually, funny enough, uh, <laughs> just before, uh, just before, uh, as I was, uh, before we connected, um, I, I recall one time of, of a, an unfortunate loop, but it, it, a, a, a chap in Spain uh, was meant to be showing me how to uh, it was go out on a, a bodyboard, I think it was. Uh, and as it turned out, he wasn't as he wasn't as skilled as he believed he was. So I, I ended up having to go in the water to try and encourage him <laughs> because he was getting dragged out. And as a result, I stupidly got swept away into the into the uh into the sea and that was be that was before i knew about rip tides and rip currents uh and uh they're very dangerous for anyone that doesn't know about when you go into a foreign country find out about the currents uh there's an awful lot of people die every year when they go on holidays and they're swept out to the sea because they don't understand the power but as you know the rip current comes down usually at the end of the beach and we get a concentration a very strong speed uh of undertow which which carries you out, which you can't resist out to sea. And very soon you're out of sight of land, which is not pleasant when you have waves, which are very big uh, on both sides. And I remember distinctly, uh, you know that people confuse a near-death experience with nearly dying. I hear a lot of that recently, but this was a nearly dying experience. So I was out there between the glassy waves in the U getting, getting smothered by, and I was thinking... I was very foolish. That was the main thought. What, what, what a stupid way to, to go. Um, but I was also conscious of two other things. That in those circumstances, uh, you, there can be a seductive voice which says, give up. Just give up now. It's okay. It'll be okay. Give up now. Just let yourself go. This, this, this is a kind of thing. This is found, for example, Kurosawa did this with uh, it, it's a common theme in Japan. If you're, you're, you're lost out in the snow and then you're, you're kind of dying and you're yielding and it seems nice and just give up because it'd be easier. It's something in the psyche, in the body or in, in human nature, if you like, that informs. And, uh, but the other, the other main thing was that uh, just to relax and the only way you could get out of it was by relaxing so if you're if one is using spiritual traditions they have to be useful for you in life and breathing and that is useful so uh, i i did relax as, as far as i could until something could happen now the uh, i eventually to cut a long story short got back to shore 
Uh, but I was very lucky I could have, could have drowned because, of course, if you go with the rip the rip tide, it's a loop. It, it can if you go and don't struggle against it at a certain stage, it will bring you back or it will help you back or you will be able to swim back on it to to the uh, to the shore. So, in all these cases, when we're having all these discussions, we have to be careful to be calm about the things. We we have to we have to be careful not to panic in relation to things, not to give in to fear, not to think that we're going to be overwhelmed by, by, by circumstance, by anything which seems beyond, because that's how we're made to, to, to be fearful. And this, all the spiritual traditions should be about giving peace and comfort so that we can act in, 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 in a proper way in relation to challenges. And then also, there's always going to be positive loops. There's always going to be loops of intervention. There's always going to be the angels. There's always going to be some circumstance. There's always going to be someone that turns up at the right time. There's always going to be possibilities of finding way, way, ways out. So I don't want to, uh, in all this context, I never want to be negative about it. I think we have to be sensible. We have to be forensic. We have to be disciplined. And we have to draw on the traditions as well. Uh, so uh, none of this, uh, so when we're having discussions with other people, it's to uh, it's a, that it's a discussion where we 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 all learn from. So, thank you very much as always for your conversation and for your patience and listening to me a long answer sometimes. It's a great pleasure, James. I think we keep digging a little deeper each time we speak, and I hope we have many many more conversations. Uh, I don't want to say like this one because I know they'll spiral around and, and take us further each time. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, James, thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, thank you very much, Jeffrey. Appreciate that. Thank you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.